American philosopher, sociologist, and political theorist, associated with the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. Born in Berlin, Marcuse studied at the universities of Berlin and then at Freiburg, where he received his PhD. He was a prominent figure in the Frankfurt-based Institute for Social Research, what later became known as the Frankfurt School. Between 1943 and 1950, Marcuse worked in the U.S. government service, which helped him form the basis of his book, Soviet Marxism, a critical analysis. Celebrated as the father of the new left, his best-known works are Eros and Civilization and One Dimensional Man. This lecture is titled, The Intimation of a Post-Capitalist Society in Marxist Capital, and will be delivered by Professor Peter Hoodis. This lecture will be chaired by Dr. Michael Bree. Can I please request our speaker and our chair to come on stage? Michael Bree is a senior fellow at the Institute for Critical Social Analysis of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Berlin in the field of history and theory of socialism and communism. He's the chief editor of the series Contribution to Critical Transformation Research. Dr. Bree, I request you to take over the proceedings. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to chair this uh, Peter Marcuse lecture. <laughs> as, I, as far as I'm coming from, as I already said to you, from GDR, um, Peter Marcuse was, of course, one of the worst enemy ever yeah? <laughs> um, for a lot of my teachers. So, but uh, uh, just to tell you a story, then I had to, I could not get the book in the GDR. Yeah, it's difficult. Well, there was a special special uh, part in the library uh, called the, the poison literature, yes. the poison <laughs> part. Yeah? And there was Trotsky and a lot of other very interesting guys and I had some problems to get access. But then I went to the Soviet Union and had no problem as a foreigner to get access to all this literature. Um, this is uh, stupidity of um, Soviet type socialism at least. Uh, okay. Nevertheless, I, I really am very glad uh, that I can share this session also because the session where uh, Peter Judas will speak, he, as I already said, he is uh, editing the collected works of Rosa Luxemburg. We first met when you published your famous reader, Rosa Luxemburg reader. I could advise to everybody to have it. It's a wonderful selection and also the letters you have selected are, I think, even better than the German version. Uh, also because the topic of his... We have much in common. Peter, you have the floor for 35 minutes. Thank you. I hail from the United States, which is a country that has sunk to a new level of depravity, as seen in the latest decision by the Trump administration to separate children as young as two or three years old from their parents and send them to detention centers simply because they and their family members are trying to look for a better life by crossing the border from Mexico into the United States. In light of this abysmal dehumanization, I would like to frame my comments in the spirit of solidarity with the children of the earth. Two hundred years after Marx's death, uh, Marx's birth, <laughs> there is no problem more urgent to address as well as difficult to resolve than developing a viable conceptual alternative to capitalism. Capitalism's drive to subject even the most mundane human activities to commodification is rendering the bonds that connect individuals more abstract and indirect, while severing as never before our connection to the living ecological environment. At issue today is whether humanity even has a future, as we know it, if a viable alternative to capitalism fails to emerge. However, developing such an alternative is proving very, very difficult. And I think there's two reasons for this. One is simply the nature of capitalism itself. 
which is based on a system of increasing wealth in monetary expression or value as an end in itself. Since value can only show itself in a relation between physical, material entities, it appears and necessarily appears that what enables products to be exchanged is the natural property of the things themselves instead of a historically specific form of social labor. So capitalism has to appear natural and immutable, at least initially, precisely because it is a system based on value production. But of course, there's another reason it's very hard to develop today a viable alternative to capitalism, and that is the failures of the so-called socialist or communist experiments. Social democracy, despite introducing some valuable reforms at times, utterly failed to pose an alternative to capitalism. Its capitulation to neoliberalism has discredited it and left the door open to be filled by xenophobic nationalism and racism. The so-called socialist Marxist-Leninist regimes, meanwhile, proved no less of a failure. Their replacement of market anarchy by state command economies produced extremely repressive regimes that over time simply reverted back to market capitalism when all that became so evident. You know, the Polish workers used to have a joke, but it's no longer such a joke. Uh, they used to say, what is communism? The longest route from capitalism to capitalism. So, the problem we face today is that the idea of socialism and communism that was long advocated has proven to be inadequate, and no alternative vision that speaks to the aspirations of masses of people have arisen to take its place. So the question is how to begin anew. In my view, we need to begin anew by revisiting Marx's critique of value production. Now, of course, this sounds counterintuitive. How can Marx's capital, which analyzes capitalism's law of motion, have anything to say about a post-capitalist society? Yet, it can do so precisely because Marx's critique is dialectical. Dialectics does not simply examine the nature of a thing. It also examines what lies behind or beyond its nature. Hegel put it this way in The Science of Logic, and I quote, In order that the limit applying to something in general should also be the barrier, something must pass over into itself beyond the limit. It must, in referring to itself, relate itself to it as something which it is not." End quote. That is, we cannot grasp an object as a totality simply by describing what it is. To know an object in its totality is to grasp its process of becoming into what it is not. And that's exactly what Marx's capital achieves, which is why it can contain a number of very important intimations about a nature of a future socialist society. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that Marx was writing blueprints for the future. No. But he did not spend 30 years writing capital to present a totalizing system that locks us inside a circle from which we can never escape. There is a way out, unlike in Dante's Inferno. Instead, capital delineates the fetishized forms of human relations in societies dominated by capital for the purpose of discerning its opposite, what it means to be a free human being. No one developed a more comprehensive critique of capital than Marx, and for this reason, I believe, few developed a more profound intimation about what can replace it. These intimations reveal a conception of communism that is radically different from what many followers as well as critics of Marx continue to adhere to, and I think one person who understood this very profoundly was Herbert Marcuse. As he wrote in the preface to the first edition of Raya Dunievskaya's book, Marxism and Freedom, in 1958, let me quote Marcuse, Marxian theory does not describe and analyze the capitalist economy in and for itself, but describes and analyzes it in terms of another than itself in terms of the historical possibilities which have become realistic goals for action. This union is well brought out in Dunievskaya's discussion of capital, which shows that the most technical economic analyses of the process of production and circulation are just as firmly committed to the humanistic philosophy as are the critique of Hegel 
and the theses on Feuerbach. So with those eyes, I wish to say a few words about the intimation of a post-capitalist society in Marx's capital. In doing so, however, this first needs to be a word of caution. One cannot understand either Marx's capital, what he's saying about capitalism or post-capitalism, if one views the categories that he employs in his analysis as eternal, quasi-natural factors that apply to all forms of society. Money, private property, the market, do not mean the same thing in capitalism as they mean in pre-capitalism. Most important, Marx held that production for the sake of increasing wealth in monetary form or value is unique to capitalism and capitalism alone. Value production neither exists before it nor shall it exist after it. After it. So, the distinguishing mark of capitalism is that labor assumes a value form. Value is the expression of a specific kind of social labor. So therefore, that means labor as such is not the source of value. According to Marx, only a particular kind of labor can be the source of value. A commodity's value is determined not by the actual amount of time taken to produce it, but by the socially necessary labor time established on a global level. Put it this way, if value were determined by actual labor time, workers would be made to work as slow as possible since the greater the labor time expended, the greater the accumulated value. But as you all know, this never happens because the value of a commodity is determined not by actual labor time, but by socially necessary labor time, an average over which workers have no control. This average varies continuously due to technological innovations that increase the productivity of labor. The drive for capital accumulation compels concrete labor, the various kinds of labor employed in making use values, to become increasingly dominated by abstract labor, labor that conforms to an abstract average. Abstract labor is the substance of value, Marx always tells us, which takes the phenomenal form, Erscheinungsformen, of exchange value in the market. So, value may be a very rather abstract category, but it depends upon a very concrete kind of activity, labor that is constrained by a time determination that controls the worker instead of being controlled by her. Once labor assumes a dual form, in which abstract labor dominates concrete labor, productive activity becomes ever more monotonous and thing-like. This reification of the worker's concrete sensuous activity in the drive to generate greater amounts of wealth in monetary form is the essence of capitalism. Now, many assume that Marx had the same theory of value as Ricardo, but simply drew different uh, conclusions from it. Uh, since Marx uh, singled out the existence of surplus value, the difference between the value of labor power and the value of the product, whereas Ricardo failed to do so. In other words, there's a widespread assumption that Marx, at, like Ricardo, had a quantitative theory of value. Um, and it logically follows from this assumption that Marxism is a radical version of Ricardianism in that it seeks to affect a fair redistribution of value by providing workers with a greater share of the surplus product. But in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Unlike Ricardo, Marx does not have a quantitative theory of value. He does not hold that actual labor time or concrete labor is the source of value. Concrete labor is only the source of use values. He emphasizes again and again that the substance of value is abstract labor a qualitative determination that Ricardo, like all the classical economists, simply ignored. Ironically, most Marxists have also ignored it, as seen in their failure to grasp that value production applies to capitalism and only to capitalism, precisely because it is a system that's based on the peculiar social form of labor that is endemic to its class relations. Now, these distinctions are not scholastic. They determine one's view of the alternative to capitalism. We all know all societies devote a certain amount of time to labor. If actual labor time is the source of value, it follows that all societies, including socialist ones, are defined by value production. 
And if value production characterizes all forms of society, whether pre-capitalist, capitalist, or, or post-capitalist, it follows that abstract or alienated labor, which is the substance of value, characterizes all forms of society as well. The peculiar social form of labor that defines capitalism becomes treated as an immutable, transhistorical fact of human existence. The whole point of Marx is capital to take issue with those who transform into eternal laws of nature and reason, the social form springing from the present mode of production becomes turned on its head. Once value production is assumed to be a permanent feature of the human landscape, there is no exit out of capitalism. You can't envision it in an adequate way. Moreover, attempts to abolish surplus value by redistributing value fine as that is for temporarily redressing some of the inequities of capitalism, is likewise fruitless, since it leaves untouched the class relations that give rise to these inequities in the first place. Surplus value follows from value production, not the other way around. To try to eliminate surplus value and profit while leaving intact the peculiar form of labor that defines the value form of labor power is akin to cutting off the head of Hydra while leaving its body intact. It's only a matter of time before many heads will grow back. In fact, that has been the fate of status socialism in the 20th century. In sum, therefore, an exit from capitalism requires an uprooting, uprooting <coughs> the inverted human relations that make value production possible. There's simply no other way out. As the young Marx put it, Mikhail quoted this yesterday, all emancipation is a reduction of the human world and relationships to humanity itself. That perspective never left Marx. But the question we have to ask is, has it left us? The radical nature of Marx's humanist critique of capital, however, is often unrecognized. For example, David Harvey has recently argued that it was Ricardo, not Marx, who actually had a labor theory of value. He rests this on the claim that the value created in production is illusory as long as it is not realized through market transactions. He writes, and I quote, I take the value created in production to be only a potential value until it is realized. An alternative way would be to say that the value produced, the value is produced, but then the value is lost if there is no demand for it in the market, end quote. But if abstract labor, as Marx insists, is a substance of value, how can the value of which it is the substance be lost? Does not this imply that abstract labor's existence also depends on the market? But Marx clearly says the opposite. He writes in Capital, and I quote, the value of a commodity is expressed in its price before it enters into circulation, and it is therefore a precondition of circulation, not its result. Let me read that again, because this is really, really key. I didn't want to bother with PowerPoint. You know, enough of that. <laughs> the value of a commodity is expressed in its price before it enters into circulation, and it is therefore a precondition of circulation, not its result. This is Marx. Now, to be sure, this is me now, <laughs> realization is a major dimension of capitalism. However, what is realized in market exchange is not value, but capital. The value is already there before it enters into circulation. If capital cannot be exchanged for money, however, then the value embodied in it is destroyed. And guess what? That's repeatedly what happens in recessions and depressions. You have the destruction of capital. However, if the value of a commodity does not truly exist until it is realized in exchange, as Harvey argues, it follows that the elimination of value production and the transcendence of capitalism hinges upon managing relations of exchange. Focusing on relationships between things, such as prices, commodities, and markets, becomes viewed as the key for exiting capitalism. Such market-based solutions leave untouched the social form of labor that grounds capitalist social existence. So here is where it becomes really important not to treat categories like money, value, exchange value, etc., as quasi-natural categories without reference to the specific social relations of which they are the expression. Money, for instance, does not mean the same thing in pre-capitalist societies 
defined by the exchange of use values, as in capitalism, in which use values are produced for the sake of exchange. In capitalism, money is a universal equivalent, and a universal of equivalent becomes possible only insofar as labor assumes a value form. Since abstract labor is the substance of value, value requires above all an independent form by means of which its identity with itself may be asserted. That independent form is what we call money. The more that abstract labor dominates concrete labor, the more all-pervasive becomes the drive to increase value. And the more this goes on, the more value must posit an abstract self-identity with itself. This means that the logic of capital compels money to assume a form independent of the concrete material properties that make its existence possible. And by the way, this is a, per a wonderful explanation, I think, for bitcoins and all this stuff. The increasingly abstract nature of money makes capitalism more unstable and turbulent. Bubbles abound. Monetary crises increase in frequency and severity. But here things get a little bit tricky, folks. Many see such financial crises as a decisive issue, which leads them to argue that greater governmental control of financial and capital markets can produce an exit from capitalism. However, this overlooks the fact that financial or monetary crises are made possible, and indeed necessary, by the ever more abstractive character of human social activity. As a result, the need to transform the human relations that necessitate that money take the form of an abstract universal is not addressed. We have an irony here. Actually, it's a painful one, but I have to share my pain, <laughs> if you allow me. As we all know, Marxism arose and developed by insisting on the transitory historical nature of capitalism. Every Marxist said this. Yet by limiting its critique of capitalism to the surface phenomenal level, the level of exchange and markets, etc., it treated the peculiar human relations of which they are the expression as natural and immutable. Marxism ended up falling into the same trap that Marx wrote Capital in order to refute. As the U.S. Marxist humanist philosopher Ray Dunyevskaya, who I mentioned earlier, wrote in the book Marcuse, wrote the introduction to Marxism and Freedom, and I quote her, Marx's primary theory is a theory of what he first called alienated labor and then abstract or value-producing labor. Hence, it is more correct to call the Marxist theory of capital not a labor theory of value, but a value theory of labor. Marx's analysis of labor, and this is what distinguishes him from all other socialists and communists of his day and ours, goes much further than the economic structure of society, his analysis goes to the actual human relations." End quote. Now, Carol Kosick, a magnificent Czech philosopher, I think put this in a different way, but beautifully in his book, you should all read, Dialectics of Concrete, where he said, and I quote, Marx's theory is a critique of economics in the proper sense of the word, because it exhibits the real movement of economic categories as a reified form of the social movement of people. This critique of Marx discovered that the categories of the social movement of things are necessary and historically transient existential forms of the social movement of people. So with that, let me just get, say a few words about the actual intimations of a post-capitalist society in Marx's capital. And one of the most striking places this appears is where we least expect it the place where Marx exposes the absolute dehumanization of capitalism, and that is the section on commodity fetishism in chapter one of volume one of Capital. Uh, he tells us there that this commodity fetishism is very difficult to dispel. You can't just say you wake up in the morning and read a book and now you're not subject to commodity fetishism, right? It's much more difficult to get rid of than this because, he says, commodity fetishism is adequate to the social relations it expresses. It's not just an illusion, yes? So how do you get out of it? He says the only way is to transport yourself mentally to different modes of production. So he therefore starts by talking about pre-capitalist modes of production in which uh, common ownership of the means of production prevail without the value relationship. He then turns to the future, writing, and I quote, 
Let us finally imagine, for a change, an association of free men working with the means of production held in common. You know, I find this very nice. He says, let us finally imagine, so we haven't been doing that yet, right? And a, for a change, which means we really haven't been doing it yet, and yet he's saying we have to imagine. Uh, since when did Marxists get this idea that imagination is a dirty word? Uh, come on, folks. Uh, uh, Gautry Spivak was good about this. Uh, Reimagine. It help, it'll help you. It's good for your health. All right. Now, in this statement, Marx is not referring to a merely formal transfer of private ownership to public or state ownership. Transferring the property deed is a mere juridical relation, which does not necessarily free the working class from, working class, from class domination. Marx explicitly refers here to free men only the means of production, which means they exert effective and not just nominal control over the labor process. And that, of course, is not possible unless the workers democratically control the labor process. Now, I have to say, I don't know about you guys, but we in the United States have a problem getting this point across because we have an edition of Volume 1 of Capital that's got a problem. And the problem is it's got a long preface by a guy called Ernest Mendel that runs on for 75 pages. You see, you must read Mendel first to understand Marx, they're telling you. Uh, you know, don't ever introduce a great work of literature with a 75-page introduction. Let the man speak for himself. Uh, but Mandel makes the argument there that Marx's concept of communism is associated production. Associated production. This is a distortion. Marx's concept of communism is freely associated, produces controlling society. Freely. You take the word freely out and replace it, they just leave it as associated production, that could be a straight line to Stalinism. Marx goes on in this passage, I quoted, to state that in a post-capitalist society, products are direct objects of utility and do not assume a value form. Exchange value and universalized commodity production come to an end. Producers, freely associated ones, decide how to make, distribute, and consume the total social product. One part is used to renew the means of subsistence, the other is consumed by members of the association a, a, a means of production, the other is consumed by members of the association as means of subsistence. He invokes neither the market or the state as the medium by which this is achieved. He instead envisions a planned distribution of labor time by producers who are no longer subjected to socially necessary labor time. Abstract labor is abolished since a concretum, actual labor time, becomes the measure of social relations instead of an average over which the workers have no control. That is, a new society by Marx is here defined as a freely associated exchange of activities instead of an exchange of commodities based on an abstract average over which the workers have no control. Socially necessary labor time confronts the individuals as a person apart, irrespective of their sensuous needs, whereas actual labor time is the sensuous activity of individuals mediating their relations with nature. Distribution of the elements of production on the basis of actual labor time marks a radical break from capitalism since it signals that the split between abstract and concrete labor has been abolished. This form of organizing time is the cardinal principle of Marx's concept of communism. The distinction between actual labor time and socially necessary labor time is really crucial to get because if you conflate them, it leads to the erroneous view, shared by market socialists as well as Stalinists, that socially necessary labor time is an inevitable part of human existence that will always be with us. But if that is so, it follows that abstract labor with its dehumanizing characteristics will also always be with us. The new society becomes defined by the principles that govern the old one. In contrast, Marx stresses that in socialism or communism, the two mean the same exact thing in his work, by the way. There are no separate socialist or communist stages. That's an invention of post-Marxism. He argues that socially necessary labor time in socialism or communism is abolished. Time no longer confronts the worker as a person apart. Instead, time becomes the space for human development. He put it this way in volume two of Capital. He writes, with collective production, I'm quoting him, money, capital is completely dispensed with. The society distributes labor power and means of production between the various branches of industry. There is no reason why the producers should not receive paper tokens permitting them to withdraw an amount corresponding to the labor time from the, action, from the social consumption fund. 
but these tokens are not money, they do not circulate, end quote. Now, Marx carries this discussion forward from Capital into his 1875 critique of the Gotha program, where he very explicitly says that in a lower phase of socialism or communism, even in that phase, producers do not exchange their products. That's right, he says. Right from the first moment of socialism, the producers do not exchange their products. Just as little does the labor employed on the product appear as the value of these products or as a material quality possessed by them, since now, in contrast to capitalist society, the individual labor no longer exists in an indirect fashion, but is a direct component part of the total social labor. That is. Yes, thank you. Generalized commodity production emerges in the, uh, comes, at the, uh, comes to an end in the first initial phase of socialism since abstract labor, the substance of value that enables products of labor to be universally exchanged, no longer exists. With democratic, freely associated control of the means of production, the producers themselves, and not some external force like socially necessary labor time, now governs their interactions. Hence. Labor, however, itself does not come to an end in this lower phase of socialism, since, he says, actual labor time serves as a measure for distributing the products of communal activity. That is, the individual producer receives from society exactly what he gives to it. What he gives to it is so many hours of actual labor, and then the individual gets so many, uh, so many goods based on that are produced in that equivalent amount of actual hours of labor. Marx is not suggesting here that the worker's labor is computed on the basis of a social average of labor time. Here, labor time simply refers to the amount of hours that the worker produces in a given cooperative. But of course, who decides this distribution based on actual labor time? Doesn't it leave the door open for a hierarchical monolithic force to decide this for the workers? The answer is no. Why? No, because distribution by actual labor time means no social average is in control, which means that what counts as an hour of labor in one cooperative is not going to be the same in another. It may take two hours to produce something cooperative A, but three hours because of varied local conditions in cooperative B. That is decided based on the local conditions based on the, through the democratic decisions of the cooperative majority. So since there isn't a... Um, depersonalized abstract force governing labor time, the barrier for a monolithic homogeneous social force to dominate the worker is overcome and dispensed with. Okay. Now, of course, this is still only the lower phase of socialism or communism, which is still defective. Nevertheless, what Marx is telling us is something very, very important, and that is the break with value production has to occur from the inception of the moment of the arrival of a socialist or communist society. So, there is a key qualifi qualifier I have to single out here, though. Marx is not posing remuneration based on actual labor time as some formula for a new society that has to operate literally. He's simply asking, what kind of re social relations will arise once value production is abolished? As he says in the critique of the Gotha program, there's no need to make a fuss about distribution. He says relations of distribution automatically, that's his phrase, automatically will result from certain relations of production. Once you have effective and not just nominal worker control of the means of production, he says here are some of the sort of forms of distributing the social product that could arise. But of course, the specific form is going to depend on so historical and social conditions that Marx can't tell us in advance and I can't tell you in advance either. Now to walk my conclusion. Tragically, the intimations of a new society found in Marx's capital did not inform the perspectives of post-Marx Marxism, where any discussion of a future socialist society was not dismissed as utopianism. Uh, it was that his socialism became defined by replacing market anarchy with state-directed economic plans. Now, of course, Stalin declared in 1936 that by eliminating the free market and private property, the Soviet Union had abolished, had, had created socialism. But you know, there was a problem here. P 
people in the Soviet Union and the Soviet students in the Soviet universities asked, well, wait a second, we've got universalized commodity production, wage labor, exchange value, and an average rate of profit all operating in our economy. These are all tied by Marx to the capitalist law of value. And all Marxists, including Marx, said that the law of value only operates under capitalism, but we have this, how can we call it socialism? So Stalin said, oh, 1943, he said, ah, well, actually, they were all wrong. The law of value does operate in socialism. It's simply uh, now nothing to worry about because the party will manage it in your interests. Ah, okay. The tragedy here is that this largely defined the terms in which the communist movement viewed a post-capitalist society for decades afterwards. Mao Zedong, who learned his Marxism not from Marx but from Stalin, took this notion that generalized commodity production and value production exists under, under uh, socialism one step further by claiming that even class struggle exists under socialism. What's the point of socialism then? In a word, if the critique of capitalism is limited to the surface phenomenal level, the understanding of the alternative to capitalism will be limited to the surface phenomenal level. But Marx did not have, I argue, a superficial or phenomenal understanding of the logic of capital, which is why his critique of political economy, despite his objections to utopianism, provides vital in insights into what constitutes an alternative to both free market capitalism and the state capitalism that called itself communism. Now, as I argue in my book, Marx's concept of the alternative to capitalism, where I discuss this in much greater detail, I do not argue, I do not argue, that Marx gives us the answer to the alternative to capitalism. What matters today is not what Marx said in 1843 or 1883. What matters is what does Marxism mean for today, in 2018. And we have to ask that question with full knowledge of what does it mean in light of the aborted revolutions of our time, as well as the emergence of new forces of liberation, racial minorities, women, LGBT people, and others who were not considered by earlier Marxists. With these eyes, we re-examine Marx to see what, what we can learn and develop further for today. But, so re-examining Marx's work with new eyes is just where our work begins. But without a proper beginning, it's not possible to find our way to an adequate end. You know, it's often said that philosophy, just, um, philosophy is often said to be a perpetual search for a proper beginning point. And I think that's just as true when it comes to envisioning alternatives to capitalism. Paul Mason, a British journalist and writer, recently spoke to this three weeks ago in an essay in the New Statesman, go get it. It's a fascinating essay called, uh, in which it's titled, Why Marx is More Relevant Than Ever in the Age of Automation. And he states the following. Here's my last paragraph. <laughs> Paul Mason, quote, the dilemma is clear. Either Marxism is about the liberation of the individual human being, or it is about impersonal forces and structures which can be studied but very rarely escaped. During the past 50 years, much of left-wing academic thought has followed the anti-humanist path that Louis Althusser laid out. However, if we are to defend human rights against authoritarian populism, we must have a conception of humanity to defend. The impulse towards freedom is created by more than just exploitation. It is triggered by alienation, the suppression of desire, the humiliation experienced by people on the receiving end of systematic racism, sexism, and homophobia. The economic system that replaces capitalism will have to be shaped around the goal he outlined in 1844 ending alienation and liberating the individual. Peter, thank you very much. We are just jumping into discussion. We have left some minutes um, for free discussion. Please. Yeah, please start. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your fascinating talk. Uh, Just to hear better, yeah? yeah oh, I see. Um, my question is uh, how we go from there, you know, here to there. I know, you know, your discussion doesn't cover that when you look at Marx, for example, but in expanding um, workers' control over production uh, through corporations, I wonder what the role of political parties and the state in sort of tra this transition would be in your opinion. Thanks. 
okay please yeah there mm. yeah thank you sir uh, i was just wondering uh, do you have any experience of labor managed firms which have developed in uh, some regions of western europe and what is your experience about distribution of surplus and uh, developing a new kind of model of industrialization or new kind of economy in coming days thank you okay other questions if not peter then i want to ask you when i read your book i started to write in review and then it became a long long manuscript and then it vanished because i thought that's it too much um, um, but i have again one question uh, you spoke about that in a, a free associated um, um, uh, association of free producers and so on the concrete actual labor time is uh, in the, there's no no diff, also there's no contradiction between social necessary labor time and the actual uh, labor time of the individuals or uh, the collectors i and this is even with regard to um, to the first stage the first problem i i, I was i'm really wondering even for marx because if you are then applying as he said bourgeois law yeah you are applying bourgeois law. that's uh, you are measuring and i i can't i can't believe that uh, uh, just tell i will tell you one story concrete story about robert owen he organized this labor exchange in london in 1830 i think 31 or so yeah then a lot of, of workers or small scale producers brought their product there there was of course somebody sitting in the board and saying okay this is and then they bargained okay and the lot little was spent for the for the bureaucratic work and then came the wives of these workers and looked for the best products and all the others were left and after some months uh, this whole enterprise got bankrupt i just want to say that this is a, a this is intriguing because you are thinking that this contradiction between individually actual spent labor time and then of course it's a collective way and what people feel free to decide can we won i'm doubting this yeah i think this contradiction will stay with us i hope in non-capitalist forms but i'm i'm not convinced mm -hmm. uh, other fourth question please yeah and then we end. Hmm? I think I can hear from you. Thank you. Hi, thanks for that. That was excellent. Um, I just had a question. It might be more a query, and I might have missed something. You were saying that uh, in the socialist stage, well, not stage, because there's not stages, um, exchange um, is based on, uh, distribution is, um, is still based on exchange. How does that um, uh, relate to the slogan that it's to be um, you know based on need on individual needs that other element of marxist humanism um, thanks from these according to their ability to which according to their needs exactly exactly yes in terms of Bobak's question uh, on one level I, i'm tempted to answer who am i to know <laughs> Uh, uh, what transitional form would get us from here to there on another level i'm um, uh, I'm tempted to say, but you all kind of already know this. Because if we look closely at the social struggles of the past 50, 60 years, anywhere in the world, uh, major social upheavals, Arab Spring, Occupy movement, uh, we can talk about various revolutionary movements that have occurred, um, feminist movement, gay rights movement. What do we see, Hungarian Revolution, go back to that. What do we see as the form of organization or association that people have taken to advance their interests against existing society? And that is decentralized forms of organization based on direct democratic control, in which they strive to be made as independent of status domination as possible. I think this is exactly what Marx meant by the dictatorship of the proletariat. It did not involve dictatorship in the modern sense of word. In other words, this transition 
between capitalism and this socialism would have to be the, a, a process in which the superiority of the, of the state over civil society is broken. And as he talked about with the Paris Commune, here the society is now dominating the state, whereas before the state dominated society. movements of the last 50 years, we get a much, we get a lot of material that can help answer your question in terms of this. Uh, second, the question of managed cooperatives. Uh, the most famous case of this would be the Modrigon cooperatives in northern Spain, which have been ex in existence uh, for 60 years. These Modrigon cooperatives in the Basque region of Spain have uh, upwards of 150,000 workers in uh, associated communities, democratically elected, they have come under a lot of strain in recent years, and they have lost some of their democratic impulse, uh, and they've also lost some of their egalitarian character. But we're talking about a social experiment that has been around for over half a century and that involves tens of thousands of workers in dozens and dozens of different industries and enterprises. So a lot of very good works written about the Modrigon cooperatives. Uh, you can also look at Argentina and what came out of the 2000 crash and the forms of direct association and worker occupations of factories that also were run on that kind of principle. Now, Mikhail's question, and it kind of dovetails directly with Shannon's question. Yes, in the Critique of the Gotha program, when Marx discusses this <clears throat> uh, principle that he thinks would be adequate, at least one principle that could be adequate to post-capitalist society in terms of distribution according to actual labor time, that is, you give in so many hours of work to your community, and then you withdraw from the common storehouse so many goods and services that are produced in that amount of actual hours. He says, this is still defective. This is not from each according to their ability to each according to their need, because we're still emerging out of the womb of capitalism. We haven't reached the social and economic maturity yet to fully practice that principle. We need something to get there. And he thinks this is the best way to get, this is one way to get there. Um, and he, but he admits that it's defective, and he says bourgeois right prevails. But the question is, what does he mean by that? I think that's the issue. There is, he's not saying the bourgeoisie prevail. There is no more bourgeoisie. In the lower phase of socialism or communism, there are no classes. That class is abolished. There's no value production. There's no hierarchical social division of labor that excludes the working classes. The working class itself no longer exists because it's been abolished along with the existence of classes. So what does he mean by bourgeois right prevails? Simply this. The bourgeois principle of exchange. I give you so much and you give me an equivalent back. That's what he means. A quid pro quo. That's an equivalent exchange. And he says that's a hangover from the bourgeois mentality. I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to give you anything unless I get something, right? You're not going to draw something from the common warehouse unless you put something into it, yes? In terms of your actual labor time. That is still a bourgeois principle, but it has to prevail for a certain amount of time given the, the need for a time period to be able to produce the fully developed social individual. When we get to the higher, a higher phase of of communism. Paresh Chattopadre taught me this point. Very nice, uh, many years ago, Paresh told me, uh, he said, Peter, stop saying the higher phase of communism. There is no the higher phase. There's only <laughs> a higher phase. Absolutely correct. Don't forget what Marx said in 1844. Communism is not the end of human development. Huh? <laughs> Instead, we're looking at an absolute movement of becoming. But the point is, what about in a higher phase of communism, yes? There is no more quid pro quo. Now, from each according to their ability to each according to your need does not mean, oh, you, um, you, you get your needs satisfied based on X, Y, or Z amount of abilities. If that's the principle, that's bourgeois right. That's not what Marx means. It's a rejection of that whole principle. You simply get what you need and you give what you can in terms of your ability. There's no measure as such 
that's uniform or prevails through society. In the lower phase, there is a measure, actual labor time. In the higher phase, there is no labor time measure. Okay? So uh, humanity will cast off this bourgeois right as it goes through the process. I understand it looks hard for us to imagine how this could be. How can we imagine a society where people democratically control the most basic mundane aspects of their everyday existence? And we don't know whether it's going to work. Yes? What we know is that the proposals that put that to the side have completely not worked. And therefore, the real question is, we don't, I mean, look, am I banking on a, a, a new society emerging in the next six months or in my lifetime? I would hope so. But if somebody gave me a crystal ball and said, you're never going to live to see a post-capitalist society, and maybe your children or grandchildren won't either, it will not change a single thing I'm talking about. The main thing is not to hedge your bets or place a bet on whether this society will occur or will, might or might not happen. The question is, what happens to us as human individuals if we give up the perspective of directing our activities to creating a fundamentally free society? If we don't pursue that and agitate for that and structure our daily lives in light of that goal, then we become much more impoverished human beings at the very least. Thank you very much for this really stimulating vision. Now I think we are close to be invited to a communist lunch because it's <laughs> according to the needs of everybody here, at least in the room. Thank you very much for the organizers. Really. We have here spent uh, five communist days, everybody according to his abilities, everybody, everybody is getting according to his or her <laughs> needs. Thank you, thank you very much for this. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Brian, <laughs> Professor Hodis. <laughs>